Hi, everybody. You know, she needs no introduction, of course, Senator Tammy Baldwin, uh, Senator of Wisconsin. I just want to say we were standing there. Will the, will, the, will the young woman from OMB stand up for a minute? <laughs> yeah. What's your name? Uh, Nora Wiseman. I'm a fellow. Nora Wiseman, your fellow there. Tammy was very, very excited about your question. So she said, let's start there. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Tammy, you, you were excited about this question about data, and you thought it gave it you know, uh, some real insights in, into the health dimensions of this, which, which we haven't covered as much as we might. Yeah. But, but tell us why you got so excited uh, well, you know, about the, our friend's question. The topic, the title, Unfinished Business. And uh, we focused a lot in our discussion appropriately on the Equality Act right. and, and some of the major headlining uh, bills that have been introduced, the struggles around the country. I I've always been somebody very passionate about um, health care as a right, not a privilege, and the struggle for universal health care. And it's taken me to some interesting policy discussions, really wanting to understand health disparities, right. sometimes because of the lack of access to health care coverage or culturally competent uh, medical care. And so back when I was in the House, we would have panels, uh, hearings, you know, the witnesses in front from the government or elsewhere, and I'd say, it, you know, we would be looking at um, disparities based on, on ethnicity or race or socioeconomic status, and I'd say, what's the status of disparities with regard to LGBT status? And witnesses would give me this blank stare, and I literally at times got, we'll have to get back to you. And uh, it, it kind of built up to the point at which um, NIH and the um, uh, uh, Institute of Medicine did a thorough, or as thorough as they could, review of what was out there, our understanding of LGBT health and disparities. And I, while they didn't put it this way, I would summarize a lot of their findings as the data doesn't exist. <laughs> we don't ask the question in our long-term uh, uh, surveys on, on people's health. Uh, and so as, as was noted, and what I got so excited about backstage was that um, while Congress has not yet remedied the situation by mandating this data collection, uh, this administration has really stood up and said where we can administratively, we're going to start gathering that data. We're going to mm -hmm. start implementing some of the many recommendations that were in this uh, Institute of Medicine report. Um, but we have a long way to go, and I can tell you every time I, mm -hmm. I bring it up in the context of legislation, I get a lot of pushback, a lot of... Uh, you know, uneducated pushback saying... From you know, your you, colleagues. From my colleagues saying things like, you can't ask young children about their mm. sexual habits. Well, come on, we, we need to... If you can't define a challenge, if you cannot uh, produce data to talk about, say, the impact of stigmatization on somebody's health throughout their life, how are you going to fix it? So we have to name the problem, identify it, and that requires... And you've been active, I, mean, and, and, you know, I, I know you were a big leader in kind of dealing with a lot of the bullying issues and whatnot that also gets into some of this. Yeah. But on the data front, um, we had, we had uh, Brad Sears of the Williams Institute here mm -hmm. in, on, on uh, uh, sound, because we, we didn't get him on the flight last night. But he also addressed the same data deficits, and he's been such a champion of data. When I worked in the Senate in the 1990s, when we wanted data or research done, we just sent a note to the Congressional Research Service, uh, Jeff Bingaman did. Um, can you ask the government, can you, in your role, compel the government to produce the data that might be more helpful in this? I, compel would, uh, I would say no, but certainly I actually believe that my asking government witnesses, this is during the time that Republicans controlled the House, time after time when we were focusing on health disparities, what do you know about the status of LGBT health? And they're being dumbfounded and oftentimes, you know, we, we don't have any data, we don't collect that data, we can't give you an answer, led to uh, this research that is, is sort of underway, but we have some ways to go. The other thing that you probably talked with um, uh, Brad about is census data, right. um, pre-marriage equality, uh, where you had some jurisdictions that recognized um, uh, 
same-sex marriages and others that didn't, um, we have a census question about marital status. And the Census Bureau was not doing, um, in my mind, a, 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 the right job in terms of, of getting information about LGBT families. Mm. Well, again, we need the data in order to make sensible policy. Um, now, I understand uh, there are challenges if there are different definitions, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it doesn't mean mm. that we can't get the, we, we shouldn't be able to get the raw data to understand what our family situations are. And the Williams Institute was phenomenal yeah, in pushing was... that, um, that issue and, and helping us have statistics and information that help us make wise policy. I mean, that's why we have a census, is to understand um, the reality and the struggles of Americans and people who are here. How did you get into this? <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, mean I asked, you know, service? in the beginning of public service, I knew you were on a board of supervisors mm -hmm. and, a, uh, uh, you know, I've got, you know, a, the, the common council, but... Yeah. How did you, sh I mean, I'm just interested in the origins, the deep secret origins of Tammy Baldwin's, you know, yeah. superwoman advocacy Ooh, in the LGBT goodness. arena. So, I mean, you're from Wisconsin Woo! and uh, yay. So how did, how, did, Badgers. how did you, I mean, just <laughs> short form, give me the kind of nuclear moments. Um, well, interest in public service I can track back to middle school, literally, just hmm. student council and things like that. I wasn't out then. In fact, right. I didn't even have a clue in middle school. Um, <clears throat> but when I, um, when I graduated from college, I returned to Madison, Wisconsin, uh, started working on a bunch of campaigns. Um, there were a number of very local LGBT struggles, as well as healthcare. Healthcare mm. was a big passion of mine since my childhood. And frankly, the, um, the AIDS epidemic really brought a conversion of both my passion for mm. civil rights advocacy um, and my passion for everyone having access to the highest quality healthcare. And there, um, Dane County, which is the county in which Madison is, mm -hmm. um, was actually... Um, it had its first HIV uh, uh, positive uh, uh, cases. And so it was a moment where all my passions were, uh, you know, were, were colliding in, in public policy at the local level. Uh, also, you know, it's interesting, I'm known perhaps, you know, in the Congress and the Senate for being the first. Um, there were two openly gay members of the Dane County Board of Supervisors when I huh. was elected in 1986. So the idea of my, you know, so you're sort of being the in state. the closet, yeah. uh, the, these two colleagues, my mentors, were, you know, would uh -huh. have none of it, <laughs> and, <Huh>. um, <laughs> which was fabulous. Uh, and so I was, you know, far from the first in right. my local community, um, which I think was was great because I might have been a little bit more. Uh, you know, sort of frightened of that prospect. And, and, uh, but in any event, uh, while that was the case in Dane County, it was not the case nationally. Mm. And uh, I was elected to the Dane County Board of Supervisors in 1986 um, at the tender age of 24 years old wow. with these great mentors. But and nationally, um, and I was yeah. because of these, uh, in part. And I understand you put together an interesting way to communicate with the very few well, other out I'm not going to create uh, take credit for that but there were a couple dozen in the United States actually in the whole world at right. that moment a couple dozen in the whole world yeah. out officials um, yeah. and they the, the first conference that was ever convened was um, of of openly gay and, and lesbian uh, elected officials was in West Hollywood in 1985, the year mm. before I was elected. And I was so thrilled to get to go to this second conference. But, wow. you know, this is pre-social media. So literally, we, we got together. Um, I think there were 14 of us that were in elective office. And then we were sort of counting up the folks who were in elective office but couldn't convene in, mm. in, in the, the second conference. Um, we were international because we had a member of the British Parliament there, so <laughs> international group of 14 people, and and uh, and we pledged to have uh, 
conferences every year so we could huh. benefit from one another's experience, and, you know, from small town mayors to a member of, of parliament, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, we, you know, we kept a mailing list. We stuffed the envelopes, oh. <laughs> you know, put the stamps on. It's and sometimes had useful our to remember the origins of, of, of how this happened, you know, yeah. both to inspire other folks uh, in this, and you all, know, technology has changed, and organization has changed. But now fast forward to the Equality Act, because mm -hmm. now you've, you've, you've lived this life, you've come in, and, and you've been a major leader in so many areas of non-discrimination legislation, LGBT rights legislation, repeal of don't ask, don't tell, uh, health, health dimensions of this. And now you've, you, you're a pioneer um, uh, pushing the Equality Act. And I guess I, I'd like to, in the time we have, just quickly frame it but then tell me why it's not a pipe dream. Oh, well, first of all, you talk about um, you know the, the various battles um, that are uh, you know that have been undertaken and now are law. First, hate crimes, and then repeal of "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." There's a, the Supreme Court case granting marriage equality. Um, I think actually, are you shocked every time one of these succeeds? No. Or was it by design and you knew it was going to happen? Oh, my goodness. I, I, no, I always, um, I'm an optimist. I mean, why, <laughs> why would you run I for office if you side. didn't believe that it could work, that uh, it could yeah. produce positive results? <laughs> I mean, oh, my goodness. It, it's so frustrating so much of the time, but mm. I've not given up hope right. that, <laughs> that we can make progress um, in that way, and to think how, I mean, I, I go back to hate crimes. Um, I, I, I remember, I, I'm going to just share, a, a, there was a private conversation. We had a young staffer in my house office who was doing some of our social media work, and he said, oh, you know, I want to do a quick video of you. You just saw it get signed into law. Um, you know, what, what do you feel? What do you think? And I said, you know, this, it, it's amazing. It's the first time um, a president has ever signed any law, um, you, you know, sort of using the words mm. gay, lesbian, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity, mm. you know, until uh, it's like the first time. And he said, uh, after we taped it, and he then respectfully, you know, Congresswoman, I think you mean the first time this president ever signed. And I said, no, we, we just witnessed the first time ever in our nation's history. Right, right. And that wasn't that long ago. And then we've seen these other advances, um, which is precisely why I don't think the vision of um, the Equality Act passing is any sort of pipe dream. Do you think progress can continue under a Republican president? Uh, it has to progress has to continue under any circumstances. It's, it's it's continuing under a Republican Congress. Um, it, we're not passing a lot of pro LGBT laws right now, but there are other but ways hope, progress though, down the road. is happening. Well, and and as we see, sometimes it's the courts, sometimes it's the states, right. sometimes it's private sector corporations. We we're just talking about the executive order that means that there are steps that private sector America is taking to um, you know, think about uh, the implications of having uh, uh, equitable rules in their workforce and how that helps the economy as well as society. Right. I appreciate that whole picture framing. That was the question I or the answer I hoped you would, you well, would get. I, I tend to be. I mean, sometimes I ask the cynical questions, hoping that someone will help define why it's all so really going to work so anyway. Yeah, well, let's talk uh, even about under it. the even under some very scary leaders uh, down the road. <laughs> uh, but but you know, what what do we want? We want to change hearts. We want to change minds, and we want to change laws. And they all kind of interrelate. I mean, there is something to be said about having a law that says discrimination is wrong, right? Uh, it sends a signal to society, but uh, that doesn't mean people won't still do it. Right. And we know access to enforcement of laws is not even. And, and um, so all of those things are important, which is why uh, passing laws relates back to a movement that is about visibility and, and um, being vocal and having 
the world, having our neighbors, having our coworkers know us mm. for well, who we you. are. Let me go to the audience uh, to get some questions, comments. We have one over here? Nope. Uh, questions, comments? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Shy audience. Uh, oh, yes, right here, in the, right in the middle. Is that Chris? Chris Johnson of the Washington Blade. You should all read him. He's a great writer. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the compliment. And everyone shall read me. That's I asked him to go through. But <laughs> I, I actually asked Chris to go. I, mean, I watched Chris go through the line with the president of the United States one time, shake his hand, and said, will you do an interview with me? And it was very, it was very brave. <laughs> go ahead, Chris. Um, uh, the, what I want to ask you about, Senator, was the recent vote in the House on the uh, legislation that would effectively bar Syrian refugees to come into the United States. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are upset because uh, three of the uh, members of the LGBT Equality Caucus actually joined Republicans to vote for that bill. I'm just wondering what your view is on that legislation, and if, uh, how, how would you vote if that came up in the Senate, and if you could speak to a little bit about if you feel there's some sort of connection with you being a LGBT advocate and some sort of connection with those refugees, because a lot of them are, feeling are, 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 are uh, fleeing anti-LGBT persecution at the hands of ISIS. Right. Um, I would vote no on that legislation if it were to come before the Senate. Um, but I think also one of the things that I've found to be important, especially as um, Americans are agitated and frightened in light of uh, what they've witnessed globally, uh, both in Syria and Iraq, but also in Paris and San Bernardino, um, one of the things that I felt I could do as a member of the Senate is use the opportunities presented to us to educate uh, the country, frankly, on what the refugee admission or asylum seeking admission process is versus other things that you're now hearing a lot more about, the, uh, the 20 million travelers a year who come into the United States through the visa waiver program or the, I think I got the number yesterday, 14.6 million who come in um, using a, 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 some other type of visa. Uh, it, so that we can understand that our refugee uh, process is the most rigorous of all of the ways to get into the United States, often taking between 18 and 24 months. Um, Visa waiver, uh, you know, another uh, another thing altogether, and so we need to be rational and certainly not just playing the politics of the moment or uh, tapping into people's fearfulness. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be uh, informed and educated, and and I can use my position in the Senate hopefully to help. Uh, educate my constituency and my colleagues to some, some degree. Um, and, and I think you've seen what we thought was going to be an immediate reaction in the Senate to take up the House pass bill to a real pivot in the conversation and sort of let's, let's look um, uh, where, where we mm -hmm. need to be looking. Senator, let me just ask you just in closing, uh, one of the things that we've, we're putting on the table today is that if you lift beneath the surface of marriage equality and some of the successes, there's a lot, a lot of unresolved, left behind challenges, whether we were, we were just talking about Chai Feldblum and what she had done with the American Disabilities Act, and I was mm -hmm. telling me earlier, it would have been nice to bring in some of the disability dimensions of LGBT, mm -hmm. something I hadn't thought about, uh, the global uh, questions that you right. and I have spoken about in the past. Uh, Homelessness uh, and, and LGBT youth, particularly, uh, you know, in, in uh, with 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 children of youth of color, um, and on and on. And I'm interested. I mean, again, going back to your origins and how, what, as we leave the stage, what advice and counsel do you have for stakeholders in those discussions as they try and advance an agenda that moves these other civil rights questions and equity questions forward? Um, you know, I. I, I I touched on it a, a, a moment or two ago, but that any sort of public policy discussion has to go hand in hand with um, a continuing movement of um, speaking out and being visible. I mean, I go back to the early sort of post Stonewall days mm -hmm. of the movement of, um, of the importance of being out mm. um, and uh, 
making the day when I, um, that all of my colleagues have to acknowledge knowing and in many cases loving somebody or having great affection for somebody who is part of the LGBT community mm -hmm. and then wishing them no harm <laughs> and, and beginning to think about uh, how they vote on measures or how they advocate based on uh, knowledge, not mm -hmm. the, the myths that used to uh, and stereotypes that, that preceded the knowledge. So I, I, I think uh, perhaps what unifies all of those things is um, the necessity for people who are a part of the LGBT community to be um, vocal and, and um, visible and our allies to be just as vocal and visible. Final question. In, in the Senate, you know, you hang out with all these folks, uh, a lot of guys. <laughs> Who would you sit, want to give a hero award to on the Republican side for moving the most on these issues? Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 let me just tell you a story that I think is, is neat. Um, it, so when we were voting on ENDA last uh, session of Congress in the Senate, um, we were struggling to make sure we had the sufficient, you know, six, right. over 60, 60 votes. votes. Yeah. And one of the people who um, I wanted to speak with and, and talk to at significant length was my colleague Jeff Flake from Arizona, because I knew he had voted for um, a non-inclusive uh, ENDA in the House mm. and voted for it. But I also knew that he had some reservations about um, the bill and the form that we were voting on an inclusive, uh, transgender inclusive. And, um, and I asked if he would be willing to speak with um, uh, somebody that we knew mutually to sort of talk through mm -hmm. and ask some questions and somebody he had great respect for. And, um, I, this became public. I wouldn't have told the story uh, a, a couple of years ago, but um, his son actually gave an interview. A bunch of senators yeah. and, and House members' children spoke out to a journalist uh, about so how they had... So his son said, here's what my dad did? Yeah. He, he talked to Tammy, and then he talked to this other person. Who was the other person? Well, I, we can't say oh. because of, of the sensitivity I of see. that situation. But, um, but it, in any event... Um, I, I remember him having the conversation, this was the night before the vote, and saying, thank you, Tammy, for um, putting us in contact with one another, and I'm going to vote for it. And uh, So that gets a gold star from Tammy Baldwin. Absolutely. Okay, and great. It was an amazing... Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Tammy oh, Baldwin, thanks. thank you so much.